The Chinese Coast Guard and militia vessels, acting as low-level pawns of Communist China's navy, have long caused headaches for many governments around the world. They do not create enough trouble to warrant a full naval response, yet serve as an effective gray zone for Beijing to exercise its maritime ambitions. Late March this year, 220 Chinese ships were docked around Whitsun Reef, claimed by the Philippines. Tensions between the two sides have been renewed after the recent detention of 220 Chinese ships on the reef, which is also claimed by China. Beijing has argued that the Chinese vessels were near the disputed reef to get out of the wind. But the Philippine government believes that the crew of the fishing boats are not ordinary fishermen, but armed Chinese communist militia groups. I directed the Philippine Navy to deploy additional uh, uh, naval assets to the West Philippine Sea to increase our visibility. So uh, we do not uh, tolerate uh, incursions in our uh, territorial waters uh, from anybody. Philippine Defense Secretary Delphin Lorenzana issued another statement on April 4, saying, the continued presence of Chinese maritime militias in the area indicates their intention to further occupy the West Philippine Sea. The Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, who has been seeking to engage Beijing, has in recent days made unusually strong statements through his chief legal counsel that the incursion of hundreds of ships into nearby waters could lead to hostilities and stressed that Philippine sovereignty is non-negotiable and that not a single inch of its territory and exclusive economic zone will be relinquished. But only one day later, President Rodrigo Duterte dialed down the rhetoric. We will continue to resolve the issues on Julian Felipe through diplomatic channels and through peaceful means. Whatever differences we have with China will not define our bilateral relations and will not be an obstacle. Before discussing the significant event of China's enactment of the Coast Guard law on January 22 of this year, let's take a broader look at the Chinese militia fleet. It is widely believed internationally that the vast majority of Chinese fishing vessels are Communist Party militia vessels, and that many of them are armed. Since 2015, these Communist militias have been gaining strength and have established their headquarters in the Shisha Islands. They usually train together with the Navy and the Marine Police. The official Chinese-English language media, China Daily Online, reported in 2016 that Beijing is committed to improving the combat capabilities of the maritime militia, which is mostly made up of Chinese fishermen and participated in four naval exercises in 2014 and seven naval exercises in 2015. In three years, local fishermen assisted in more than 250 operations at sea, they have become the third maritime force, in addition to the Chinese Navy and Coast Guard. These maritime militias have received systematic training and logistical support, intelligence gathering, surveillance, and detection and sabotage operations. For decades, they have conducted intense operations in international public waters and foreign-owned waters to intimidate legitimate fishing operators in other countries in order to increase the influence of the CCP and gain strategic advantage. In April 2013, Xi Jinping visited the town of Taomen, Henan province. In 2016, an Al Jazeera reporter had noticed a number of people in uniform training in the area. And Chinese government officials explained that these people were filming a movie. A fisherman named Wang Shu Mao said the fishermen wore the uniform to protect themselves from the sun and when asked, claimed to know nothing about the maritime militia. But Wang Shumao is described in the Chinese media as the deputy commander of the Taomen Maritime Militia Company. In 1985, China's armed fishing vessels are economically and militarily valuable to the Communist Party. Despite growing international condemnation and accusations, China's ocean-going fishing vessels continue to expand in size.
Future Directions International, an independent Australian not-for-profit strategic research institute, released an analysis last October that concluded that China has been overfishing its territorial waters since the 1980s. Conservative estimates suggest that at least 30% of fish stocks in Chinese waters have been completely depleted, and that another 20% of the fish resources have been overexploited. Since then, China's coastal fishing industry has shifted to aquaculture and offshore fishing. China now operates the world's largest ocean-going fleet with global reach. According to this report, Chinese offshore fishing vessels often stray into legal gray areas, intruding into the exclusive economic waters of coastal states around the world. They are the largest culprits of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or IUU fishing, worldwide. According to official Chinese data, the China Fisheries Statistical Yearbook shows that China has nearly 3,000 ocean-going fishing vessels with a total value of about 3.65 billion US dollars in 2019 and an annual catch of 2.17 million tons, a 3.9% decrease from 2018. Of this, China's pelagic squid catch is estimated to account for 50 to 70% of the global catch. A June 2020 survey by the London-based Overseas Development Institute revealed that China's ocean-going fleet could be as large as 17,000 vessels, netting all the world's waters for predatory fishing and illegal fishing practices that intrude into the exclusive economic zones of many countries within 200 miles to reap huge profits. Chinese vessels have parked around the fishing grounds for a very long time, waiting for the season to begin. In 2017, more than 20 Chinese crewmen were caught by the Ecuadorian government illegally fishing for thousands of protected sharks off the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific Ocean. The Chinese crew members and ship owners were each sentenced in Ecuador to prison terms ranging from one to four years and hefty fines of nearly five million. Last June, the Ecuadorian Navy reported that more than 340 Chinese fishing vessels were sailing in international waters off the Galapagos Islands. At least 149 of those vessels had turned off their GPS systems to prevent being tracked. The Chinese fishing boats had been wandering around Ecuador's exclusive economic zone for more than three months before heading to Peruvian and Chilean waters. An analysis by Oceana, a marine conservation group, said that in just one month between July 13 and August 13, 2020, hundreds of Chinese fishing boats spent a total of 73,000 hours fishing off Ecuador's Galapagos Islands, endangering the survival of species such as seals and hammerhead sharks in the waters. The disruption to the food chain may also reduce the number of local economic fish. Beijing pours state power into supporting ocean-going fishing vessels. For example, oil for fishing vessels and the price of the catch are subsidized by the government, which leads to unfair commercial competition between national fisheries. In a survey conducted by Andrew Erickson and Connor Kennedy, contributors to the U.S. diplomatic journal The National Interest, the government of China's Henan province subsidized steel fishing boats, which are larger and have a range of 2,000 nautical miles compared to the wooden junks that previously operated only in offshore areas. These new fishing boats with a draft of about 500 tons cost about 5 million yuan, or 760,000 U.S. dollars. Of that, the Chinese government provides about 1.8 million yuan as a subsidy. A Washington Post reporter found that about 50,000 fishing boats in Hanan province were provided with navigation and communication systems almost free of charge. These systems help fishermen to call for assistance from maritime surveillance vessels in case of emergency. In an interview with the Voice of America, Li Kuanting, Director General of the Taiwan Tuna Association, said that China has frequently used its diplomatic power to cooperate with many countries in recent years to seize fishing rights, allowing Chinese fishing vessels to legally enter the fishing grounds of their diplomatic neighbors. For example, the Pacific island nation of Kiribati, which is made up of 33 islands, has rich fishing resources in its surrounding waters and is one of the largest fishing grounds in the world. 
Kiribati and Taiwan signed a fishing cooperation agreement, but after Beijing went on the diplomatic offensive in 2019, mainland China replaced Taiwan and became Kiribati's main fishing partner, enjoying rights to the local waters. The Chinese government denies all allegations that it deploys a maritime militia disguised as fishing fleets. China's fisheries management practices are fully consistent with the requirements of international law. China strictly follows the management measures of the relevant regional fisheries organizations to enter fishing in the relevant high seas areas, and the measures in terms of vessel position monitoring are stricter than international standards, and its performance in compliance is well received by the the fishery organizations. The Chinese government also revised its fisheries law in April last year, presenting the world with a comprehensive system and measures for managing offshore fisheries. China has even built a blacklist system, which imposed strict penalties such as revocation of fishing licenses for three to five years on vessels and crew members who operate in violation of the law. Will China's ocean-going fishing vessels really enforce these nice-sounding laws and forgo the great wealth that comes with the IUU fishing method described earlier in this video? Given that China's information is largely opaque and does not allow for third-party investigations, this is hardly reassuring to other countries. In 2017, the UN Security Council banned the purchase of fishing rights from North Korea, and Beijing agreed to the decision. But an analysis of satellite data found that more than 700 Chinese vessels continued to operate illegally in North Korean waters between 2017 and 2018. In 2019, nearly 800 Chinese fishing boats were spotted fishing in North Korean waters. Now we come to the second layer of the Chinese Communist Party's gray zone camouflage in the maritime domain, the Coast Guard. This force has hundreds of heavily armed ships, some of which are the size of naval cruisers. On January 22, China enacted the Coast Guard law. This law gives the Chinese Coast Guard the power to use all necessary means, including the use of weapons, to stop foreign vessels. This means that the CCP can unilaterally escalate the Coast Guard's use of force. The most critical issue is that the CCP has not delineated the territorial waters to which its laws apply, and has long disputed sovereignty over large areas and islands in the South and East China Seas. China's Coast Guard law means that any foreign fishing vessels, expeditionary or research vessels working in the South China Sea could be forcibly seized. Vietnamese, Philippine, and Malaysian settlements in the Spratly Islands could be violently dismantled, and Japanese fishing vessels and Coast Guard units operating in the Daiyu Islands could be expelled by force. It is worth noting that the Chinese Communist Party has recently placed jurisdiction of the Coast Guard under the Central Military Commission, which means that the actual operation of the Coast Guard is entirely under the chain of command of the People's Liberation Army. Other countries, Coast Guards, such as Australia and the US, are only under military jurisdiction in the state of war. That means that the Chinese Coast Guard's operations go far beyond the civil need to protect coastal waters. They now touch deeply on maritime disputes with neighboring countries. In this way, China has used Coast Guard ships and militia vessels disguised as fishing boats to clash with neighboring countries. Such confrontations constitute a political gray zone. In the South China Sea and surrounding waters, Communist China has effectively deployed a large integrated fleet of ships, including Coast Guard vessels and militia vessels disguised as fishing boats. These fleets operate in concert to occupy disputed maritime areas, clash with vessels of hostile nations, and interfere with U.S. Navy patrols. However, the CCP limits conflict to a blurred state between military and non-military. 
This balance, by maintaining a conflict but not enough to cross the threshold of war, has helped the CCP achieve its goals of continuous encroachment and expansion in the South China Sea. But it keeps the countries involved in the South China Sea in a constant state of stress. Parallel to the above camouflage is the speed and scale of China's artificial island construction in the South China Sea, a project in which Beijing has now largely achieved its goal of reclaiming islands in the South China Sea. Why has Beijing chosen to reclaim islands in this highly controversial area? The South China Sea dispute refers to the dispute between China, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Taiwan over sovereignty over the 12 nautical mile territorial waters and 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone overlapping the East, West, Central, and Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, and the United States, in defense of the world's right to free navigation in this important economic waterway, argues that no country should overreach in this area, creating a tug-of-war between five countries and six parties. However, to the Chinese Communist Party, the South China Sea region is a very tempting target. First, the South China Sea is a semi-enclosed land-based sea between the five countries, part of the Western Pacific Ocean, and an important shipping lane connecting the Indian Ocean. According to the World Shipping Council, WSC, 25% of the world's maritime shipping will use this lane to transport to all continents, including 60% of China's foreign trade, more than 85% of Japan and South Korea's oil, and 90% of the U.S. Western Pacific raw material trade. Second, in order to develop a second-strike sea-based nuclear weapons capability, the CCP must find an ideal hiding place for its strategic nuclear submarines. Looking at the surrounding Bohai Sea and Yellow Sea, the average water depths are only 18 meters and 44 meters respectively, making it impossible for submarines to hide. The average water depth in the East China Sea is more than 1,000 meters, but with Japan, which has the world's best anti-submarine capability to the north, and Taiwan to the south, China's strategic nuclear submarines are still easily exposed here. Therefore, the CCP expects to master the South China Sea, which has an average water depth of 1,212 meters. Chinese military and other documents indicate that a new Chinese military base in the Spratly Islands is collecting data on the South China Sea to support construction projects in the area. This would improve naval weapons and underwater communications and potentially support People's Liberation Army amphibious landing operations or other military activity in the future. In addition, the South China Sea is extremely rich in a variety of strategic resources. For example, according to census data from China's Ministry of Land and Resources, there are more than a dozen known major oil-bearing basins in the South China Sea continental shelf, covering approximately 852,400 square kilometers, or almost half of the total area of the South China Sea continental shelf. Among them, the South China Sea oil reserves of at least 23 to 30 billion tons, accounting for one quarter of the world's oil reserves, 20 trillion cubic meters of natural gas, the second Persian Gulf. For example, the South China Sea contains a large amount of combustible ice, or natural gas hydrate, which generates dozens of times more energy than coal, oil, and natural gas, and does not produce any residual after combustion. This resource is the equivalent of 19.4 billion tons of oil, or six times the proven oil and gas geological reserves in the South China Sea. In addition, the South China Sea is extremely rich in polymetallic manganese nodules and similar resources. In 2002, the CCP signed the Declaration of the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea with 10 other ASCAN countries, reaffirming the principles of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But when the CCP deemed the South China Sea to be its core interest in 2010, these treaties were forgotten. In 2013, Communist China built islands on several disputed reefs and shoals, and in the same year, the Philippines filed the South China Sea arbitration with the United Nations Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. The arbitration result in 2016 was based on the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and denied Beijing's claim to the resources and islands in the South China Sea within the nine-dashed line. In today's statement, the United States expresses its hope and its expectation that both parties will comply 
with their obligations. In the aftermath of this important decision, we urge all claimants to avoid provocative statements or action. In 2014, the CCP authorized the installation of an oil rig in disputed waters, causing Chinese and Vietnamese vessels to ram each other. 2020 saw a standoff between Chinese and Malaysian ships in the Chiang Thai Reef. 2020 also saw a Chinese vessel ram and sink a Vietnamese fishing boat in the waters off the Paracel Islands that April. On the 18th of that month, China set up two administrative regions in Sansha City, Shisha, and Nansha, with Chinese government units stationed in Yangxing Island and Yangxiai Reef, respectively. On August 26, 2020, the U.S. Trump administration imposed sanctions for the first time on the CCP's militarization of the South China Sea, including the inclusion of 24 Chinese companies involved in the construction of artificial reefs in the disputed areas of the South China Sea on the list of entities and the imposition of visa controls on some Chinese citizens. In February, the U.S. technology company Similarity released a report on the dynamics of the South China Sea. The report said that China has been building military facilities on Meiji Reef, just over 100 nautical miles from Palawan Island in the Philippines, for several months, and may be turning it into a military base. Analysis of satellite images shows that seven sites on Meiji Reef have changed significantly from May 7, 2020 to February 4, 2021. Why is Beijing so keen to use this disguise? Isn't Beijing worried about not getting the balance right and triggering a war? One possibility is that this ambiguity allows the Chinese Communist Party to prepare for a possible war, and it is difficult for other countries to make timely judgments and responses. Because of this great camouflage, an invisible invasion force could be formed. Russia has used similar tactics, with Russian soldiers wearing unmarked uniforms and masked, known as Little Green Men. While claiming not to have troops on the border, Russia sent Little Green Men to invade Ukraine and annex Crimea. It was under this cover of lies that the West failed to make a timely judgment on Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014. In fact, the rapid economic rise of Red China has made Beijing feel good about itself in general. Beijing believes that the balance of power between China and the U.S. is tilting in the CCP's favor, with the East on the rise and the West in decline, and that the tipping point will come in the next few years. Beijing believes that China's strategic military power has now leaped to the point where it can not only be proud of itself, but also pose a serious threat to the United States. The U.S. military is aware of the Chinese Communist Party's intentions. In its 2018 report on Communist China's military power, the U.S. Department of Defense noted that these maritime militias play an important role in achieving the Communist Party's political goals without having to fight. However, it also appears that the U.S. is willing to limit the conflict to confrontations between Coast Guards rather than direct naval involvement, thereby avoiding a full-scale war. Of great security importance to the U.S. is the first island chain. The Republic of China, or Taiwan, is the country that the Chinese Communist Party has always wanted to take. The CCP always claimed that Taiwan belongs to the mainland People's Republic of China. Taiwan does not have sufficient strategic depth, so any delay in the war effort could lead to the most serious consequences. If Taiwan and its allies, the U.S., are confused by the appearance of a mainland Chinese fishing boat or Coast Guard vessel and are faced with a sudden military aggression, the consequences would be unthinkable if they are slow to react and take countermeasures. Now that the U.S. and Taiwan are working together to strengthen the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard has approximately 240 patrol boats over 65 feet in length and is currently in the process of upgrading its fleet. 11 new patrol boats, 378 feet in length, and 64 patrol boats, 154 feet in length. The strengthening of the U.S. Coast Guard's presence in the Indo-Pacific through cooperation with Taiwan demonstrates the U.S.'s determination to check and balance the Chinese Communist Party in general. On April 5, Australia, the U.S., Japan, and India, members of the Quad, participated in a French-led military exercise at sea. Warships from the four countries and France sailed through the Indo-Pacific region for a three-day naval exercise in the Bay of Bengal aimed at containing Communist China. At present, and for the foreseeable future, Communist China is far less powerful militarily than the US and its key allies. 
But in Beijing's red genes lies an unpredictable madness, and in the face of such vast seas, it will take a coalition of more nations with many naval and coast guard forces to truly contain the CCP's maritime ambitions. The economy is Communist China's primary weapon. Beijing is now economically tethered to ASEAN with far-reaching strategic implications. The China ASEAN free trade area was fully launched on January 1, 2010. According to Chinese customs data, China ASEAN total foreign trade exceeded the $600 billion mark for the first time in 2019, growing by 9.2%, making it the fastest growing region in terms of foreign trade with China and the second largest trading partner of the mainland, accounting for nearly one-seventh of the mainland's total foreign trade. In the first half of 2020, ASEAN went one step further, overtaking the EU as the mainland's largest trading partner. Beijing believes that the prospects for trade development between the two sides remain broad in terms of economic growth prospects, labor supply and costs, bilateral international division of labor, and regional economic integration. At present, ASEAN's basic preference is to rely on China for its economy and the U.S. for its security, and is unwilling to choose a side between the CCP and the U.S. So far, there are reports that ASEAN countries such as Indonesia, Brunei, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Laos have received donations of the COVID-19 vaccine from the Chinese Communist Party. But ASEAN may be coming to their senses. A February survey by the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore found that 63% of the more than 1,000 academics, government officials, and business people surveyed had no trust in China and refused to believe that China would do the right thing to contribute to the world, a higher percentage than in 2020 and 2019. If they had to choose between supporting the US or China, 61% of respondents would choose the US. We would like to invite you to subscribe. We strive to bring you the latest news, commentary, and insights out of China. Be sure to click the bell as well so that you're notified when we post new content.